First order of business is to welcome back our Sunday morning bulletin. You all will keep this because uh, 50 years from now, it'll be on eBay and you can sell it for a small fortune. This is our first post-COVID bulletin. So there you go. So just hold on to it. Don't lose it. Keep it for posterity for your great-grandchildren and then you can tell them the story. Um, other things that are going to happen today. Uh, has everybody got communion there should be, should have been some in every seat. Everybody got communion? If you do not have communion, raise your hand. They need two in the back, two here, three here. All right. Or you can wait and come to the youth service tonight and have communion there. We're having communion everywhere today. So every time you turn around, you'll be able to have communion. So there you are. Neat. Did you guys get your communion? Just keep your hands up till you get your communion. Also, Bill and Ronnie, we're going to do the doxology today after the offering, so when you get all set, just hang on back there and come on down when we play the doxology. So the doxology returns today. I don't know if that makes us, I don't know if that will increase our market share on YouTube, if more people will like us, click on us, if because we have the doxology or not, but we're going to bring it back. So there you go. Other announcements. Youth service this evening, Ms. Shrewsbury is speaking, and our special music is Lauren, who's, oh, you moved on me, there you go, all right, you're here, I, I'm not going to ask, because they're, they're sitting back by the back door, they've, they've done this once already, I can tell, all righty, so, and, um, and that's, that's going to be kind of fun, so, um, tomorrow morning is men's prayer breakfast, 12 hours later is women's Bible study. You are still invited to come if you uh, are ready. Um, well, there you are. You all ready for tonight, Miss Shrewsbury? All right. All right. Um, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, missions committee is in the fellowship hall. Staff parish committee is in here. And then I think that that is it. Um, if you are on Wednesday, if you are... We're in the choir, are in the choir, would like to be in the choir. I would like to see you at 6.30 in the fellowship hall. And we just need to take, talk to each other. I want to see where you are and uh, where we are with things in general. I'm not saying that <clears throat> we're going to start singing. I'm saying we just need to talk about where we are. Um, because there are some things that have to happen. Um, that's one of the reasons Staff Parish is meeting um, on Tuesday. So... Uh, if you are a choir member, and I would love to have you with me, or if you would like to be a choir member, I would love to have you with me in the Fellowship Hall Wednesday at 6.30. Are those all the announcements? Are we all set? Anything else? Everybody bring you one more week for undies. One more undie Sunday. All right, you all good to go? So just remember to do that. Um, the uh, clothing bank, if you are looking for some place to donate, they have had a funding cut, so if you would, uh, if you're looking for somebody to help out, they would they would be in need of help. So we'll, um, I'm hoping that will get brought up at the missions committee meeting. So, all right, anything else this morning? Are we all set? All right. In that case, I'm sorry, I've got the contemporary worship. They look they look alike, so I, I put my my bulletin over. So there we go. All right, so if we would stand for our opening hymn, first three verses of Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Go ahead, David. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids us arise. Tis music. 
music in the sinner's ears, tis life and hell and a peace. You may be seated. All right, if you all would keep me in your prayers, I'm going to start making phone calls, and we are going to start seeing if who's vaccinated, who's not vaccinated. And I have my first pastoral visitation set up for, it's not quite a post-COVID world, but it's close enough. So um, we're going to start talking to people about, about that. So if you would, you would keep me and them in your prayers, we'd appreciate that. Mary Hildreth needs to be in your prayers, especially this week. Thelma Sheeler is better, but not best. So uh, somebody wanted to let me know this week that our prayers have done, indeed made things better, but we still need to keep praying for her as well. If you would remember the family of Lois Sutherland, um, if at some point you are sitting there and you get a vision of heaven and you see the, the ramparts of the New Jerusalem, I suspect that uh, uh, you will see uh, Lois and Frankie and Barb just standing up there and, and waving. So they're uh, waiting for you and praying for you. So just uh, keep the family in your prayers. Uh, Butch and... Um, Butch and Bootsy, if you would remember them as well. There are other folks who are in and out of rehab and, and, and who are shut in, and if you just remember all of them, that would be a good thing. So is there any other emergencies? Any other emergencies? Yes, ma'am. Charlotte Leslie. Uh, she has been taken to the hospital this week, so if you would remember Charlotte as well. So, all right. And if you have nothing else to pray for, another volcano has erupted in the Congo, so... That would make uh, that would make 60 active volcanoes. Not that I'm counting. Not that I have nothing better to do in my spare time than watch volcanoes erupt on YouTube. But uh, makes you makes you wonder what's going on. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh gracious God, it is Pentecost. It is the festival of the first fruits, and we think 2,000 years ago, when the first fruits were harvested, when the Spirit came down and bore fruit amongst your children. And we give you thanks that 2,000 years later we still celebrate. We seek forgiveness this morning, O oh God, because when push comes to shove, we're not really sure how much we believe in the Holy Spirit. It's kind of a nice concept, but it tends to upset the apple cart, and we don't like our apple carts upset, and we like things kind of sedate. But we sure could use, sure could use the movement of the Holy Spirit we pray this morning that you might forgive our reluctance to embrace it and that you might send it upon us, that it indeed might come and cause your people to preach once again, to convert once again, to prophesy once again. We pray, most gracious God, in a world filled with hate and divisiveness, the Holy Spirit might come to sow love and true justice and peace, bringing the salvation of the world in its wake. We pray, most gracious God, that the Holy Spirit might come and inspire the hearts, inspire the hearts of the faithful. We pray, O oh God, for those who need the heal Spirit's healing touch, those whom we have mentioned this morning, those whom we have in our hearts and have not shared this morning, our world and our country, we pray especially for those who mourn in those places in the world where the, the pandemic is running rampant at the moment. We think of those folks in Central America and those folks in India. And we pray that your spirit might minister to them. Be with us now in this hour, that your spirit might speak to us, enliven us, and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lauren's ready to come help us fly away this morning. If the ushers will wait upon us for this morning's offering. Your job this morning is not to put money in the plate. Your job is to be thankful for something. Don't want to lose it just yet.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Most gracious God, for all that you have given us, we ask that you bless both gift and giver. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I was in a panic. I couldn't find my mask. I was going to be stuck up here without it till next week. But if I did that, somebody would bring me some food or something, wouldn't you? At least some water. Our text for today, once again, for another year, is Acts 2. For some of you, I can't imagine how many times you've heard this. But I'm going to ask you once again to listen. You only have to listen to it once a year. But maybe this year you could listen to it like you've, you're listening to it for the very first time. When the day of Pentecost had come, they, the disciples and the group around them were all together in one place. You remember the ending of Luke? You remember where we left them? All standing in the temple, and they were worshiping and praying? You all remember that? Okay. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, what's going on here? Things like this don't happen in our church. They must be from down the street. That's not what they said. But if they were living today, they probably would. Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Instead, they comment on the hick vernacular of the Tay, whose accent gives them away almost immediately. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, Oh, they're filled with wine, or they're from down the street however you like it. But Peter, Peter standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That includes Central United Methodist Church, includes Calgary Baptist Church, includes Unity Church. Do I need to go on? Might even include one or two of the other Baptist churches. God is going to pour his Holy Spirit out onto Everyone. All means all. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. 
The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone, that would be everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. It was May 24th. Anybody know when the 24th of May is? This is a pop quiz. Anybody know? Tomorrow. There we go. I can't hear you with your masks on, so you have to be rowdy, okay? It's hard. It was May 24th, 1738. And a young, demoralized John Wesley wended his way through the streets of London to an address on Aldersgate Street. There is only a plaque there now. And on that night, the 24th of May, 1738, I doubt that Wesley's heart was troubled by the England in which he lived, an England so well characterized by Charles Dickens and Alexander Pope. It was in England with a huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and powerful, gathered in the corridors of powers and, my friends, in the backs of churches and in Sunday school rooms, discussing how they all might great make, uh, make more, yeah, there we go, I talk for a living, make great their advantage. They sat in their salons and complained about the working conditions, the women in the sweatshops and the children in the mines and the lack of people being educated and no children in schools. And like Ebenezer Scrooge, they did little to nothing to remedy the situation. Talk was good enough. So what was, I suppose, in the, front, in the forefront of John's mind? I want to suggest to you that maybe it was his failure. It was John Wesley's utter failure. It was the prison colony of Georgia. I will make no prison colony of Georgia jokes this morning, but just know that we all could. It was his inability, John's inability, to bring religion and reform to the people of Georgia. Rather than converting a single soul he became a mockery in the community, his own hard and unforgiving heart casting him out of the colony in the very end. It was his failure to have faith on the deck of the storm-tossed ship on his return to England. The Moravians, one of those small, teeny-weeny little principalities that made up most of Germany prior to World War I, before Bismarck got done with them, just as little any big principalities, people from Moravia. They prayed and they sang and they put their trust in God. While well, John Wesley, in fear and sickness, cowered in the hold of the ship. It is said that when crisis occurs, your true theology will shine forth. Sound vaguely familiar? Anybody from Thursday night? I'm quoting Susan Richter, sorry. But it's true. When crisis hits, you find out what people really believe. And John Wesley was in the hold of the ship. And then there were the words of Peter Bowler when the storm was over. John Wesley came to him and wanted to know, how, how on earth could you in the middle of a storm pray and sing and trust in God? when the ship could have been coming apart at the seams. How could you do that? And Peter Bowler's response to him saw exactly what John Wesley did not have. And maybe the words were impudent, maybe they were insulting, but they were his words none of the less. Preach faith, Mr. Wesley, preach faith. Until you have And John Wesley knew that it was true. See, John Wesley had works. He was a, he was a good guy. But he didn't have faith. His life was full of clothing the poor. Volunteered regularly at the clothing bank. 
did more than I do. He'd be down at the prison once a week visiting everybody in prison. And he'd always take food with him. And he'd take food to the people on the streets. But everyone's reckoning John Wesley was a good man. Why, well, he'd even gone as a missionary to that wild and woolly colony of Georgia filled with prisoners, wanton criminals. What more could God ask of a man? What more did God want? So John sat in Aldersgate Street. I don't know if it was a it was a pew or a bench or a chair. I do know that his heart was troubled beyond words. What did God want? And then there were words from a German-speaking preacher, from a German-speaking commentary, Luther's commentary on Galatians. John Wesley heard the words that you must be saved by grace through faith. Now I imagine that there was a struggle. See, John was a, was a good man, and we've said that. His, his heart, however, told him otherwise. His heart knew that he had failed in Georgia. His heart knew that his pride had cost him the love of his life. His pride knew that he was hated by the people in Georgia. He had lost his parish. It occurred to him in that moment, in that desperate hour, it occurred to him that God would forgive him. That God, God would forgive a good man. You got it? Because even a good man has pride. Even a good man fails. John had preached that God forgives. God forgives all sins of everyone everywhere. And if you know me well enough, you know that I will say that when the minute you say God will forgive everybody's sins everywhere, you might just as well be saying God doesn't forgive anybody anything anywhere. And all of a sudden, John Wesley realized that it wasn't about the world, it was about John Wesley. It was about him. It was about his sins and his pride and the things that he would not admit to himself. All he had to do, all he had to do was reach out and trust. And in that moment, Wesley said his heart was strangely warmed. His heart was strangely warmed. That's not exactly the testimony of the Holy Spirit we are looking for today, is it? That his heart was strangely warmed. And yet, through the work of his Holy, the Holy Spirit on that night, the embers of his faith began to burn more brightly. And with the salvation that Wesley claimed on that night and the Holy Spirit coursing through his life came assurance. And with that assurance came a fire that could not be quenched. The Spirit would move Wesley over 250,000 miles on horseback. Y'all sleeping? You are, because you never rode horseback. You imagine, I can't make it a half hour on horseback, and things start to hurt that shouldn't hurt. 250,000 miles on horseback, and 44,000 sermons. Barely get through two on a Sunday. Can you imagine? 44,000? 44,000. But the flames of the Spirit 
jumped from one person to another until a fire of holiness raged across all of England, burning in the campfires of thousands of small groups that met every week to study the Bible and to pray and to lift each other up and to hold each other accountable and to listen for the Word of God and the Spirit of God to move in their lives as it overtook all of England. Nothing Nothing was more important to those first Methodists than to gather in their group every week and to pray and wait for the Holy Spirit and to be sent out into the world. Nothing! We can't even get our kids to baseball practice on time. The Spirit had waited for John. It waits. It waits for all of us, really. It has waited since the beginning of time when it brooded over the face of the waters creating all that was good. And you remember God created man and woman and said it was very good. The Spirit has waited for you to be made a friend of God place where the Spirit can find rest and residence. John Wesley could have read our text for his day. I I wish he had. It would have made it so much easier if John had read the second chapter of Acts and found new life, and I wouldn't have to sit here and make the jump. It would have made for a much easier sermon. He should know better. If John had read our text for today, and he does eventually. He would have known from Luke that God had been preparing for the day of Pentecost, for the coming of the Holy Spirit throughout all of Scripture. Luke heard the prophecy and quotes it from Isaiah 32, 15. And the words of the prophet Joel are placed on the lips of Peter, and Peter uses it as the centerpiece for his sermon to explain what the Holy Spirit is all about, what the end times are all about, what God's movement amongst them is all about. Peter's world of Roman occupation and Jewish compromise and blood that had brought peace to the entire Mediterranean. It was a dire, dire world. And John Wesley's Dickens, England, was a world of pride and economic ruin for more than half of those living in the wealthiest empire on the earth. And I want to share with you that the times we live in are equally dire. I dare anyone in this room to talk to me about the goodness, the basic essential goodness of humanity after the last 17 months. I dare you. Jesus was right. We are a broken and we are a fallen people. 30,000 churches. 30,000 churches will not reopen post-COVID. You wrap your head around that. 30,000 churches. Having gone through pandemic and riot and rockets and all the things that have gone on and are going on, nine out of ten people still do not darken the door of a church. And hate runs rampant, lecturing us on economic equality while buying its own mansions. My friends, pride is the byword of the day. These are dire times. And I look out across the world and I see a valley a valley from long ago that God once showed to the prophet Ezekiel. 37th chapter, 9th verse, if you're hunting. It was a valley ravaged by battle and filled with 
dry bones. Dry bones that had existed after a millennia of bloodshed. The bones were bleached by pride and greed. They were strewn about by the cowardice and inaction of God's people. Ezekiel saw the dry bones. And what did he do? What did he do? He abandoned all hope. Sometimes, in the middle of the crisis, what you really believe comes to the forefront. God was not dissuaded by Ezekiel. Had Sunday school today, and we did the Ten Commandments. And I gave the kids the first set of commandments, and they were all made out of, oh, whatever the insulation is, Mike, what is that foam insulation? It has like a, an R whatever anyway. You, you, know, you knew I'm talking about that wonderful foam. And I had made two tablets for the Ten Commandments. And I said, gave it to the boys, because you know how boys are, because you know what's going to happen. And they came down the mountain. And I said, there Moses saw all the people partying and worshiping and doing all that stuff. And I said, Moses got angry, and what do you think he did? Well, he yelled at him. I said, no, that's not what he did. He broke the tablets, didn't he? And so the boys found out how many pieces you could smash the Ten Commandments up into. You know, they, could, they could only turn them into four to six. So. And I said, what do you think God did after that? What do you think God did after that? And one of them, whom I will not name because I don't want to embarrass his parents, said, God punished them. He punished them all. And I thought, well, there we go. And I said, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Went up the mountain, and he and God had a chat. And he came back down, and you know what he came back down with? Another piece of foam insulation. Cut into ten commandments. And said, we're going to try this again. We're going to try this again. And God looked at Ezekiel, and he said, just wait. And it started, I suspect, as a whisper at the end of the valley. And you could hear the spirit rustle, and you could watch it move across the valley. And it picked up steam, and it picked up dust, and all of a sudden you could see one bone beginning to hook onto another, and sinews <clears throat> connecting legs and muscles and feet and hands. And finally, skin wrapping itself around the lives that had been formed and the people who now stood in that valley. And God said to Ezekiel, What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? My friends, Ezekiel could only hope. Could only hope for what we see. The Holy Spirit descended from heaven and it consumed all that it touched in a way no one would ever forget. On that first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit birthed prophecy from the people, mission that would span the globe and reach over three billion people. I didn't say 3,000, I didn't say 3 million, I said 3 billion. Do you comprehend three billion? Because I don't. I don't know what that means that three billion people have been reached for Jesus Christ. Three billion. The Spirit would convert not just a nation, but a world. A world that would not stay contained in the borders of Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit would bring on its wings the salvation of our God, a worldwide Christian movement. Do you realize that the sun never sets on, not the British Empire, 
The sun never sets on the United Methodist Church. Did you ever think about that? That you are not the only ones. There are Methodists in Africa and in Indonesia, Micronesia. You know a place called Papua New Guinea. Imagine that. There are United Methodists and Christians all across the globe. And we throw up our hands and say, oh, woe is me. How can I go on? God has gone on. And who you were is who you will be. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you feel? hate that question. How does that make you feel? Who cares? I always want to know what you think. I don't, but this morning it's appropriate. I really am going to ask you, how do you feel? Because after 17 months of lockdown and some of the most hateful behavior I have seen in my lifetime, do you feel like the dry bones in Ezekiel's vision? Or is this the day of Pentecost? Which will it be? Which will it be? How do you feel? How do you feel? At the end of a pandemic, at the end of riots and violence and rockets and quarantine, how do you feel? Anybody see the Wrath of Khan? Anybody have a clue what I'm talking about when I talk about James T. Kirk and the Starship Enterprise and not, not the Jar Jar Abrams version? but the original version in the movie, the second movie that I waited my entire childhood for. The real, the real Star Trek movie when it came out. And it's the very end of the movie. And the whole movie, Jim Kirk has been complaining about being old. And I get it, because he and I were probably about the same age. Probably he's a little bit older than I am, but this is the age when you start, okay? You start complaining. You know how it goes. Oh, this hurts. Oh, that hurts. Oh, I had one of my friends, and he said to me, he said, Don, he's still in New York, and he said, Don, you remember how we used to sit around and make fun of all those ministers who get together at an annual conference, and they, they talk about all their aches and their pains and their surgeries, and, and we laugh at them? And he said, guess what I did at an annual conference this year? It's me. It all started with Jim Kirk getting bifocals, you know. Him complaining that he was old. And by the end of the movie, he had lost his best friend. That'd be Spock, for those of you who aren't real familiar with the movie. He lost his, was about to lose his, his son. Discovered he, he missed his entire son's childhood. Didn't even know he had a son. They stand there front of the view screen of the Enterprise, right? And the Genesis Project has exploded and they, they watch a, a, a new planet being born, a new solar system. And Bones turns to Kirk and he says, how do you feel? How do you feel? And after all that, Jim Kirk says, Young. I feel young as the day was new. How do you feel this morning? How do you feel? The spirit broods even now over this church and this community and this world and it waits. And the question this morning is will you let it rest on you and knit you back together? Will you let the Spirit fill you and follow where it leads? My friends, the answer to the bad news that we have seen for the last year and a half is the good news of Jesus Christ. And God sent the Holy Spirit to each and every one of you that you might proclaim the good news in the midst of bad news. And I'm afraid, 
I'm afraid you're going to have to pray for faith until you have faith, right? You are going to have to pray for the Spirit until you have the Spirit. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost. When the Hebrides revival broke out, there was a group of men and they were praying and the women were in the church and they were worshiping and I have told you this story before, but that young man who couldn't have been more than somewhere between 13 and 16 threw himself on the floor and he said, God, forgive me. Do not let my sins stand in between the work of your spirit and this community. So I want to say to you this morning that your sins are forgiven. We're going to try that, and then you're going to say back to me, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Say that with me, because we didn't do so good at the first, second, first service here. Say that with me. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. If you want to look at me, you can. God knows I have sins that need to be forgiven. Okay? But you can look at anybody, because you give that to everybody. Their sins might not stand in the way of the movement of the Spirit. So this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In the name... On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Likewise, after dinner, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. We give thanks to God the Father, God the Son, but mostly today for the gift of the Holy Spirit that it may come and rest upon you and empower you and move you to do the most amazing things. Take now and eat the body and the blood of Christ, that by the gift of the Holy Spirit, you may be empowered. Hot dog, we got balloons today. I love balloons on Pentecost because it should be a party. Would you stand for our closing hymn? Number 404. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray, yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain my Lord spoke, out his mouth came fire and smoke. All around me look so shy, ask the Lord if all was mine. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. It's every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Jordan River runs right cold, 
Chills the body, not the soul. Aimed but one train on this track. Runs to heaven and right back. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray.